Hello, and thank you for joining today's presentation in the Richardson RFPD webinar series, A Walk Around the Block. Richardson RFPD, an aero electronics company, is a specialty electronic component distributor focused on the RF and wireless communications, industrial IoT, power conversion, and renewable energy markets. With its global reach and extensive technical capability, Richardson RFPD serves its customers through component development and selection, technical support, world-class logistics and supply chain capabilities. In today's session, Jason Lee, Eaton's Global Product Manager for Supercapacitors, discusses how Eaton supercapacitors are helping to ensure 24-7 operation of robots used in the warehouse automation systems. So, without any further delay, let me turn it over to Jason. Jason, go right ahead. Hi, thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Jason Lee. I'm the Global Product Manager for Supercapacitors at Eaton. And today I'm excited to talk about supercapacitors for high cycling applications, and specifically as they apply to warehouse automation systems. An overview of my talk today, I'll briefly go through Eaton's history in supercapacitors, why a supercapacitor is a supercapacitor, what are cycling applications, and then focus this on warehouse automation designs, and then finally wrap up. Eaton has over 20 years of commercializing supercapacitors since the late 90s. For the first 15 years or so, we focused on applications in electronic designs with capacitances up to 110 farads in a single cell. In 2012, we started our first larger cell product with our XV and XB series, reaching up to 600 farads, and shortly thereafter put these cells into a standard 16 volt module called the XVM. In 2014, we released our first large cell at 3,000 farads. And then since then, over the last five or six years, we have integrated this cell into multiple module designs for applications and things such as grid storage, UPSs, commercial and off-road vehicles, and buses. In 2017, we started on a significant increase in energy density with the start of our three volt rated products. And last year, we released our first hybrid supercapacitor, which is a combination of a battery technology and supercapacitor technology, which increases the energy, energy density by 10 times. Also last year, we released our first cabinet product, which includes previously released modules, but also circuit protection for operation in UPSs and grid storage. So what is a supercapacitor? First, you may have heard the terms supercapacitor, ultracapacitor, EDLC, or electric double layer capacitor. These all mean the same thing. It's an energy storage device like a battery. However, it has up to 100 times the power, power density and specific power depending on the type of battery. So as an analogy, you can think of an energy storage device like a tank of water. A supercapacitor has a small tank, so it doesn't hold a lot of energy, or in this example, a lot of water. It has a very large faucet, so it can move the water very quickly. The faucet for a supercapacitor lets water flow equally fast in and out of the tank. In contrast, a battery has a very large tank, so it can hold lots of energy, but a small faucet. It doesn't like to provide power, and when it does, it tends to wear out quickly. Some other features of supercapacitors are that there's no moving parts and no chemical reactions. It's really just a capacitor that's moving around charge. They're safe with no thermal runaway and they're environmentally, environmentally friendly, just made of carbon, cellulose, or a kind of a high-tech paper, aluminum, and then an organic electrolyte. Let's briefly look at the construction and electrical properties of supercapacitors. They have two carbon electrodes and an electrolyte. The electrolyte contains ions, and when a voltage is applied, the ions separate with positive and negative ions, each going to the electrode of opposite polarity. This, in effect, creates two capacitors in series with one at each carbon ion interface. When the device is discharged, the ions are released from the carbon interface. Some items to note. When a supercap is discharged, the voltage drops just like any other capacitor. Under a constant current, the voltage drops linearly. Thus, the electrical equations of capacitors all still apply to supercaps. Energy stored is one half the capacitance times the voltage squared. 
So thinking about how energy is used, the amount of energy absorbed when charging or utilized when discharging is going to be one half the capacitance times the difference between the charge state and discharge state, each one of those squared. One rule of thumb to use is that if the discharge state is one half of the max or the charge state, you've used 75% of the energy. Some other equations you might remember is that the current is the capacitance times the change in voltage over time and power is the current times the voltage. You don't really need to know these for this presentation, but I thought I'd provide those to you and you can actually do the calculations to size out supercapacitors. Just a little bit more about the science of supercapacitors. The capacitance is thousands to millions of times what you may be used to working with. This makes it usable as an energy storage device. The high capacitance, as noted earlier in farads, up to thousands of farads, comes from the physics. That capacitance is the ratio of the surface area of a capacitor plates divided by the distance between the plates. In a supercapacitor, the surface is from activated carbon, which has about 3,000 square meters per gram. So that's a lot of plate area. And the thickness is one nanometer due to the electrolyte, so very tight spacing. In charge and discharge, the ions and electrons are moving but not reacting chemically along these surfaces, so the current can be very high. So let's see how they're used. One use model is what we call high cycling. There are very frequent charges and discharges occurring on the order of seconds or maybe tens of seconds. In some rare cases, we'll see maybe where they <clears throat> will occur for a few minutes. You can think of a car. So we've seen applications where there's an active suspension that's constantly driving wheels either up or down. When the wheel hits a bump, the suspension absorbs energy and stores it in the supercap. It then uses this energy to drive the wheel down to keep it in contact with the road. This can happen several times a minute, and over the life of a car, it can happen close to 2 million times. In the application we'll talk about later in detail, robots running around the clock 24-7, 365 days a year, may reach a million cycles in one or two years. Some other effects that come into play are that many of these applications are also high power, so self-heating can become an issue. They're a challenge for any type of battery, especially in industrial applications where cost of ownership, downtime, and replacement have high costs. This table shows a comparison of supercapacitors to lead acid batteries and lithium ion batteries, along some key characteristics for energy storage devices. The key points are highlighted in green boxes. Operating temperature, cycle life, calendar life, power density, efficiency, and charge rate all favor supercapacitors. The advantages for batteries are in cost per watt hour stored and energy density. This makes for very good bulk storage, but not good for cycling applications in industrial environments. This shows graphically the difference in cycle life. The supercaps at 1 million cycles is really just a specification that's used in the industry. They have been demonstrated to run for over 2 million cycles at 75% depth of discharge. If you'll recall from earlier, this means that you're going from a fully charged state to half of that charged state, or half voltage. Moving on to our focus application, it's generally material handling, but material handling is a broad range, everything from moving material with pumps and valves, all the way up to large cranes at seaports. And supercapacitors are used in all of these different types of applications. Today I'll focus on warehouse robotics, automated guided vehicles, newer storage and retrieval systems, and forklifts. These all prevent challenges in fast charging, shock and vibration, but generally reliability, and many require high and low temperatures. As I talked about earlier, supercapacitors are the best energy storage to drive these applications. They charge fast with high efficiency, have millions of cycles for lifetime, so they do not need to be replaced. Warehouse automation is of great interest, not just because supercaps are a good energy storage technology for it, but the business is booming. It's being driven by e-commerce and retailers from department stores to grocery stores getting online 
seeking speed and efficiency in providing service that customers desire. The systems to enable this are projected to grow to a $25 billion business by 2025. We see warehouses transforming from pallet racks with wide aisles for people to pick goods to now high density systems with no humans in the storage area. Inside the storage areas are now high density storage only accessible by a robot that moves material to a packing area where a human will still interface with it. AGVs or automated guided vehicles are robots that run along the floor. They're guided by a tape path on the floor, so they're not completely free moving. They can carry everything from a pallet to a box. They may have additional mechanisms to load and unload, but this is often handled by a separate robot that's fixed at the load unload locations. Movements between charges may be a few feet up to 300 feet and maybe a little bit longer. When they get to their destination, They'll recharge and fast charging is required for efficiency and to try and match the load unload sequence time. In most warehouses, the temperature is not well controlled, so surviving high temperatures is important. The space devoted to energy storage is often quite limited, and the space and weight needs to be devoted to the product being moved. Typical designs are around 48 volts, with some going up to 60 volts and some operating a little lower. There's a wide range of capacitances depending upon which type of AGV is being used. A forklift or a pallet mover is at the upper end of this range, and in some cases even higher, while an AGV that moves just maybe one plastic bin will be at the lower end of the range. Moving on to the other type of system, SRS, or storage and retrieval systems, are newer and they tend to be customized robots. The robot is a cart that runs in a track and rail system that can be hundreds of feet square and tens of feet high. So the robots will run X, Y, and Z. They charge the supercaps on powered rails inside the structure and then use the supercaps to load, unload, and move on the rails that are unpowered. Like AGVs, the supercaps need to charge fast and they're only charged for part of the journey from one location to another. These systems may be in refrigerated areas or in hotter warehouses, so again, the wide temperature range of supercapacitors is an advantage. Pretty much all of these systems use custom design modules, so typical may not be quite the right word, but we see systems operating from 48 volts up to 100 volts, and the capacitance range shown is at the module level. So overall, the power can be very high, as well as the energy storage. Now that we've looked at the application requirements and gotten some idea of the supercapacitor sizes, let's go one level deeper to look at the design considerations specifically for the supercapacitors. I won't go into great detail, but here are some of the key points. One of the most common questions I get is how to charge supercapacitors. They're quite flexible in how they can be charged with their low internal resistance and high power capability. Most customers use some type of constant current system with a voltage limit. And that voltage limit is very important, as I'll talk about in a moment. But that constant current may not be as controlled or as constant as you would think, because we're not just charging off of a fixed charger, but also off of braking energy. This is okay for the supercaps. With AGVs, with a fixed station to recharge, we typically either see customers using an AC to DC converter from the main power, or if they have a simple DC rail to power other parts of the system, they can connect directly to that, a simple resistor and diode in series to prevent a reverse discharge. A very simple charger can work. With SRS systems, there are almost always custom DC to DC converters built into the robot. In either case, ideally the motors that drive the wheels are DC motors, which can run off of a wide range of voltages to maximize the stored energy used. Supercapacitor designs always take into account the desired lifetime for the device. Is the design life for the robot five years, 10 years, or perhaps even longer? We need to understand the duty cycle, the average current, and the voltage. So the first two for the duty cycle and the average current, uh, this can affect the operating temperature of the supercapacitor cells inside the module. 
So knowing these, we can model that in and maybe have to add temperature to the ambient temperature to get the actual operating temperature. For the voltage, this is the most important parameter that we have that can affect the supercapacitor lifetime. So designing this charge voltage relative to the maximum operating voltage can affect the lifetime. And the closer to the maximum operating voltage, the shorter the lifetime. Conversely, the more the derating in voltage, the longer the lifetime. At Eaton, we have models to simulate both the temperature effects and the voltage effects on the expected lifetime. Earlier, I gave some idea of system level designs in terms of voltage and capacitance. I wanted to give you some idea of what products might be used in such designs. You can start with cells or an integrated module. For the cells and smaller AGVs and robots, you might start with four to 600 farad cells, and a design might have 18 to 72 pieces per vehicle or robot. A 400 farad cell, just to give you an idea of the size, is about the size of a D cell battery. As we get to larger robots or ones that need to run for longer distances, customers are integrating 1,500 to 3,000 farad cells, uh, maybe not quite as many cells in this case in the 18 to 36 pieces per vehicle or robot, and that's the cell on the right-hand side top there. And that's about the size of a soda can, maybe a little bit larger than that. As we get into modules, we offer standard modules at 16 and 18 volts. Uh, typically, there's going to be multiples of these in one AGV, but uh, we do have some customers that uh, use them in a more limited fashion and only use one module. And then as you get up to larger pallet movers and devices like this, we're looking at the 48 and 51 volt modules. And then of course, most of the SRS systems are a custom module. As you go from cells to modules, another question that comes up is cell management. This is similar to a battery management system, but the intent is to maximize the lifetime instead of safety, since supercaps are inherently safe. They're off-the-shelf control chips from companies like TI or Linear Tech, but simple, discrete designs can also be done. Passive refers to a very simple design that uses resistors in parallel with each capacitor. This is a good voltage control system, but means higher standby current and higher self-discharge, so you lose more energy on a constant basis. Alternatively, a shunt type system is commonly used, which is in parallel again with each cell to minimize the standby current. In this case, it is just protecting against overvoltage. So to wrap up, warehouse automation systems are a fast growing application in general, as well as for using supercapacitors. Supercaps are in production systems today and provide many advantages over batteries with long operating life fast charge and discharge, wide operating temperature, and high power density. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for attending today's webinar in the Richardson RFPD A Walk Around the Block webinar series. Thank you again to Jason Lee for today's presentation, and thank you from both Eaton and Richardson RFPD for attending today's session. We look forward to you joining our other sessions in this webinar series. Take care, and we will speak with you soon.